Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and welcome to my lesson on urbanization. We're going to be looking at the movement of people from farms to the factories and the cities during the Industrial Revolution. So the migration of people begins as the agricultural revolution in England is speeding up. So there are a couple of factors that are going to make people move from these rural areas uh, where they've lived their entire lives to these newly developing urban areas that are being developed around factories and mills and mines. The first issue that's going to bring people to the cities is the creation of the enclosures, which is where the British landlords are going to buy up and consolidate the land out in the countryside, which is going to essentially push many people off of that land and force them to find employment in the cities. The other thing that's happening is the increased use of technology on farms. So as farms become more mechanized and machinery begins to replace people, we need fewer and fewer manual laborers. So those people who typically worked farms for a living uh, are going to have to find work somewhere else. And these farmers are going to begin to migrate to these urban areas, developing around these factories, seeking jobs. So we have this mass movement of people from rural areas to the developing urban areas. And this is what leads to this rapid period of industrialization and urbanization. Urban areas are going to develop quickly around these factories. Because you are limited in transportation, most factory workers are going to be taking up residence near the factories. So we're going to see housing tenement buildings being built close to where people work. So you can imagine all of the pollution and smoke and smog coming from the factories as well as these tenement apartments where people are living. Early factories were very well known polluters of water and air through the burning of coal with the steam engines as well as just nowhere else really to dump the waste that they were producing except in the nearby waterways. So if you're working in these factories and living in these tenements, you're being exposed to pretty horrible and awful um, environments. Uh, it's polluted, it's full of waste, it's disgusting, and it's a pretty awful place to live. Now looking at the tenement buildings a little bit closer and how things are developing around these factories is it's really not being planned out at all. Buildings are going up as quickly as they can as people are attempting to make as much money as they can. The building of the tenements themselves was done pretty cheaply and without any planning in place which means there's no sanitation systems. It's gonna take time for us to develop sewer systems and water systems and ways to remove human waste and garbage. Those just don't exist yet. If you're living in these areas, you're also limited with your access to clean water. Through all the pollution seeping into the lands and seeping into the ground, it's gonna pollute uh, any of your water supplies. If you're getting your water from the nearby river, the factories are also dumping their waste in the rivers as well. So your access to clean water is pretty scarce. Your environment is completely dirty and polluted. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. And of course, in any type of environment like this, you're going to see disease begin to spread. And diseases will spread very quickly throughout these tenement neighborhoods, as especially in the summertime, uh, bugs and lice and mice and rats and all sorts of other disease carrying things are scurrying about in very, very, very large numbers. These neighborhoods are also very violent. We don't have a police force yet. Uh, they're also very dangerous. Uh, people stole quite frequently, gangs of kids running around and adults. Uh, it's an extremely violent place to live because there's really no government services available. We don't have waste collection. We don't have public utilities. We don't have a police force yet. We don't have a public fire department yet. All those things will come eventually, but in the early years of these industrial cities, uh, things were pretty terrible. In the tenement housings, again, the buildings were built as quickly as possible, as close as possible, uh, to maximize the space that was available. So uh, the tenement apartments were rather small and people crammed into them. Families tended to be rather large and many people also had extended families members with them. So you would see, you know, 12, maybe 13, 14 people crammed in a room, uh, not very big especially by today's standards. So the tenements themselves were cramped spaces. You had very little uh, access again to clean water. You don't have indoor plumbing. You have uh, privies or outhouses outside that are available to you, or you can go in a chamber pot and throw it out the window. Uh, but either way, all of your waste, whether it be your body's waste or your garbage from food and other things is not being collected or done away with. It's very, very, very bad. 
In the tenements themselves, there's very little ventilation. Also very dangerous, we have wood burning stoves and things like that. It gets very cold in the winter time and it gets very hot in the summertime and it's just a pretty terrible place to live. So I'm gonna to present to you some primary source documents uh, describing some of these conditions. I'm not gonna read through them, but feel free to pause your screen and take a look at these um, quotes. It will give you a really good sense of what is happening in these cities. Um, I don't wanna read all of them, but they are definitely worth taking a look at. So if you wanna pause as we go through, uh, I think that'd be a great idea. Hopefully those quotes gave you a better sense of what's happening in these cities and what those environments are like. And these cities are growing very, very quickly. Let's take a look at some evidence of the city of Manchester, which is gonna be a huge textile town in England. In 1773, Manchester had a population of about 27,000 people. It was a relatively decent sized town for the time, and somewhat of a market town. Uh, but by 1802, Manchester's population had swollen to 95,000 people. And in the city of Manchester, during this time period of about 27 years or so, we're gonna see the development of 52 textile factories. There was also a large coal deposit near Manchester, which meant it was easy to power that factory. So we have people coming to live and work there to work in the textile factories, as well as the nearby coal mines. And by 1851, Manchester had a population of over 300,000 people. So like London and a few other cities in England, these populations are growing extremely quickly. And, and that leads to, again, these crowded and dangerous and unsafe conditions in these cities. Frequently, the inspectors found two or more families crowded into one small house, and often one family lived in a damp cellar where 12 or 16 persons were crowded. Children are ill-fed, dirty, ill-clothed, exposed to cold and neglect. And in consequence, more than one half of the offspring die before they have completed their fifth year. The strongest survive, but the same causes which destroy the weakest impair the vigor of the more robust. And hence, the children of our manufacturing population are proverbially pale and sallow. That's from Dr. James P. K. Shuttleworth in 1832, describing people living in the city of Manchester. So all of these terrible living conditions have some very serious and very real consequences. Half of the children die before they've completed their fifth year, he says. So onto the working conditions. As bad as the living conditions were, the working conditions were just as bad, if not worse. Factories and mills and mines all had terrible conditions. Again, they're being built quickly, but they're not being built with safety in mind. The main focus of all of these places is to produce as many goods as possible, as cheaply as possible. And for those reasons, we're going to see workers being made to work extraordinarily long hours. 12 to 16 hours a day was not uncommon at all. Six to seven days a week, maybe a half day on Sunday. Extremely common for most industrial workers, especially in the early years of the Industrial Revolution. For these long hours, you're going to be paid extremely low wages. Owners kept wages as low as possible. There is no minimum wage that they need to adhere to, and they worked very hard to keep their wages workers as low as they could. Keeping your wages low would maximize your profits. The factories and mines and textile mills were extremely dangerous. Machines had exposed parts, exposed belts that could snag your clothes or your hands. They were sharp and dangerous. There was no safety measures being put into place because all of that would cost money. And the owners are not interested in spending money on those types of things. So deaths and injuries on the job were extremely common. And if you fell asleep on the job or were not working fast enough, you would also be beaten by your overseers or managers. Uh, so again, dangerous conditions, not just from the machines, but also from the people that you worked with and worked for. Child labor was also extremely common in these places. Children as young as five years old working in factories, some alongside their mothers or parents. Uh, there are no benefits for anybody, no workers' rights, and it's extremely unhealthy. So these working conditions are pretty terrible. Uh, and you spend all day there and you, then you go home to even more terrible conditions where you live. Uh, in terms of pay, men were of course paid the highest, women were paid about half as much as men were, and children were paid significantly less than women. 
And at this time, labor unions are not in really in existence, and it's going to take a very, very, very long time for unionized labor to get together to help win better conditions and pay for these industrial workers. And the way workers were treated was terrible. Feel free to pause the video and read this excerpt from an interview of a former factory worker named Sarah Carpenter in 1849. So why are things so bad in both the living and working conditions? Well, number one, things are developing rather quickly. And when that happens, you typically don't see a lot of planning and foresight and a lot of thought being put into what we're doing and the impact that it's having on people. Uh, but another very important underlying thing is this belief in laissez-faire capitalism. When we studied the Enlightenment, we talked about the ideas of Adam Smith that he put forth in his book, The Wealth of Nations. That book becomes a very important and very influential piece of work for the early years of the Industrial Revolution. And in the book, Adam Smith preaches the idea that the government should remain hands off of business, that the best thing that government can do is stay out of it and let business run itself. Let the supply and demand drive the market. And in the end, that will benefit everybody. So what we're going to see in the early years of the Industrial Revolution, and maybe sadly, even further on than probably should, little to no regulation of businesses. As in fact, businesses are going to support the uh, owners of these factories because these factories are generating wealth for the country and they're going to be aided and supported by the government when things uh, don't go well. The government is not going to support organized labor or the working class people. They're going to definitely throw their support behind the business owners. So there's no real regulation of anything for a very, very long time. Uh, and this all falls under this very extreme vision of capitalism, which is, of course, an economic system based on supply and demand and a free market. So these ideas of Adam Smith are very influential and the overall attitude was the government should remain hands off and business should be able to do what it wants to do. And as we begin to wrap up our lesson today, we're gonna to look at some new social classes that are gonna be created through this process of industrialization. Some of them we already know, but we are gonna see some new faces and some new things happening in our new industrialized society. Uh, so the upper class is still going to be the upper class. They're still going to be the wealthy. They're still going to be the powerful. They're still going to be the influential. Uh, but in terms of these industrial cities, they're going to live outside of the city, of course. They can afford transportation. They can afford horses. And eventually, they'll be able to afford other modes of transportation as well. So they don't live near the dirt or the pollution or all the gross and disgusting things that we mentioned earlier. And of course, they have an extremely high standard of living. And again, it's a very small percentage of the population. But the growing part of our population is going to come from this new middle class in our society. This middle class is essentially going to be created by the Industrial Revolution and through urbanization. And the middle class is going to be made up of mostly skilled workers, people who uh, have a trade that they had to get an education for or they had to have experience in. And because of that, they have skills that other workers don't possess. And because they are skilled workers, they are going to be paid higher wages. So in terms of a factory, you need managers. That's much more of a skilled position. You need accountants. Uh, you're going to need lawyers. You're going to need engineers. You're going to need designers. You're going to need all sorts of jobs and people that have to have high level of skills. And in our society, we tend to reward people with high levels of skills with higher and bigger paychecks. The growing middle class is going to also be able to, because they're being paid higher wages, live further away from the factories. 
so they're going to be able to afford transportation to go to and from work. So they're going to be living away from the pollution and all the nastiness of the uh, urban areas. So therefore, they can afford a higher standard of living and their children are not going to have to go to work. They can afford to send them to school. So this group is also going to develop a stronger connection to education. So instead of going to work, their children will go to school and they will grow up to become skilled workers who will then sort of maintain this uh, sense of control over this system. And we're going to call and reference this group of people as the bourgeoisie, a term that we used back in the French Revolution, to kind of reflect the same group of people, well-to-do uh, middle to upper middle class workers. At the bottom, we have the working or lower class people. Uh, working class or lower class are the factory workers and others. And these are workers who are unskilled. You do not have to have years of training in order to do one of these factory jobs. You can basically go in and be trained on whatever machine it is that you're going to be working with uh, in an hour or two or in a day or two, right? And because of that, you're going to be paid lower wages. So unskilled workers are not going to be paid very high or comfortable wages. There's also so many people available to do the job, it's actually going to drive wages further down. This group of people is going to be forced to live closer to the factories, so closer to the pollution and the grossness and the grime of these urban areas. They're going to have a much, much, much lower standard of living, and their children will have to go to work. So if they want to have a better standard of living, they mean they need more income in their houses, which means they need children to go to work. And therefore, because children are working instead of going to school, there's going to be less education and less educated people within this working class group. And we're going to call them a new name, the proletariats, this large group of working class people. And you can see the difference in those living conditions. On the left would be some conditions where you might find an average working class family. And to the right, a more middle class bourgeois family. And that's a pretty drastic difference. And unfortunately, we're going to see this in most industrialized towns, both in Europe and in the United States. A very clear divide between those of the working class and those of the middle class. To wrap things up for today, what are some key takeaways from this lesson? Number one, the enclosures and the increased use of technology on farms led to an increase in migration to urban areas. Urbanization developed rapidly, which led to terrible living conditions. Make sure to go back and read those primary source excerpts. Working conditions were just as terrible with long hours, low wages, dangerous conditions, and child labor in most factories. Laissez-faire capitalism and its supporters favored a government that was hands-off of business and did not regulate industry. And number five, industrialization redefined social classes and created a new middle class of skilled workers. Hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson. Thanks for watching.